Welcome to the law school. Uh, my name is John Broderick. For those of you whom I do not know, I'm the dean here at the law school. Uh, and I'm here tonight, as many of you are, as an interested spectator and participant. Uh, we're honored to have this event uh, kind of co-hosted with Sports Illustrated and uh, delighted they're here. Uh, I just want to identify, and, and I know B.J. Schechter, who's here, who's going to moderate tonight, is a sports journalism professor at City University of New York and Columbia University School of Journalism. And he is the executive editor of Sports Illustrated and sportsillustrated.com. He basically has the job that I wish I always had. Uh, I read that magazine religiously. So great to have you here. It's an honor. Uh, I just want to identify two people. Uh, one is Michael McCann, uh, who's uh, uh, the director, really, of the uh, Sports and Entertainment Law Institute. Uh, Mike has joined this law school within the past year. Um, he's well known and well respected in sports journalism. And uh, he's a ball of energy, and I am so happy he's at the law school. Uh, I think further down the table at the far end uh, is Alex Roberts. Uh, Alex Roberts uh, is a, a really a co-director of this program with Michael. Her background uh, is in intellectual property, uh, particularly in trademark copyright. Uh, and as we all know, in the world of sports, uh, those things are important. So Alex has been with the law school a short time. She has a very modest background. She went to Dartmouth, Stanford, Yale, and that's about it. <laughs> uh, pretty impressive, and we're thrilled that she's here. So I hope you enjoy tonight. I know it'll be interactive. Uh, and again, welcome uh, to the law school. Thank you, Dean Broderick. Um, and again, welcome to tonight's uh, town hall um, <coughs> here at the uh, University of New Hampshire Law School. Um, tonight, we are uh, going to be discussing the Ed O'Bannon case, uh, his case against the NCAA, that is currently pending in federal court in California. And this case is the most important court case in the history of college sports. And the outcome, could, outcome of this case could reshape the NCAA and college athletics as we know it. Um, I, I would like to welcome the, the rest of our panel. Um, as Dean Broderick uh, mentioned, the organizer of this event and a colleague of mine at Sports Illustrated. Uh, he's the director of the Sports and Law Institute here at UNH. Um, and Sports Illustrated's legal analyst, Mr. Michael McCann. Um, next, a shareholder at uh, Sherman Silverman in New Jersey and one of the nation's leading litigators in sports and bioethics. He's represented many sports stars, including Allen Iverson, Carmelo Anthony, and Maurice Claret, Alan Milstein. The executive director of UNH's Franklin Pierce Center for Intellectual Property and a professor of entertainment and trademark law, Alexandria Roberts. A former director, executive director of the NBA Players Association, who has negotiated several collective bargaining agreements and is now a professor at Seton Hall in NYU, Charles Grantham. <clears throat> One of the most influential people in college sports over the last 20 years, the founder of the ABCD basketball camp, the man who signed Michael Jordan to his first endorsement package, and an unpaid advisor to Ed O'Bannon's legal team, Sonny Vaccaro. And right in front of me, one of the preeminent college sports writers in the nation. He's worked for ESPN, the New York Times, and now Sports Illustrated, Pete Thamel. Tonight's town hall will be divided into three parts. In part one, we will give an overview of this case and look at the key arguments on both sides. Part two, we'll take a look at a few of the key issues and drill down on some of the specific arguments in the case. In part three, we'll focus on some of the solutions and effects of a decision or a settlement. During each segment, there will be a healthy debate amongst our panelists here, and there will be some opportunity at the end of each section for questions. We encourage you uh, to make this an interactive event, and uh, we've also left about 15 minutes at the end for further questions. So let's jump right into it. The Ed O'Bannon class action suit against the NCAA could radically change college sports as we know it. Through various legal arguments in intellectual property and antitrust, O'Bannon contends that current and former Division I men's basketball and football players be paid 
for their image and likeness on television broadcasts, video games, trading cards, apparel, and other commercial ventures. I'd like to bring in Michael McCann um, to give us an overview and the history of this case and take a look at some of the uh, overarching arguments on each side. Sure. So thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great event and we're very happy th that you're here. I also want to thank Jackie and AJ for their work putting this event together. Uh, it's really a, a remarkable event to, to have everyone here and what a panel this is. Let, I'm going to talk about the antitrust and class certification issues of this case and then Alexandra Roberts is going to talk about the intellectual property aspects of it. So very basically the O'Bannon case began in 2009 when Ed O'Bannon, a former college basketball star, <laughs> noticed that his nephew seemed to be playing video games that he was in, and he didn't grant permission for that. Now, his name wasn't in it, but players that looked a lot like him and looked like other players were in video games. And he also noticed that ESPN Classic uh, had broadcast old games where players were featured. And again, players never signed on to this. At least, they didn't seem to sign on to this. And the argument from an antitrust pers perspective is this that the NCAA and its members, including schools, including conferences, have joined hands to prevent college athletes, both current and former, from doing their own deals, from entering into their own licensing deals, from creating a video game with their image and likeness, rather than having someone else <coughs> negotiate on their behalf without their permission. Now, the NCAA has argued, well, that's not really true. The NCAA has argued it never gave away payer, the license to players' image and likenesses or their <coughs> names. If you look at the video games, they don't have players' names in them. The NCAA has also argued that there's favorable case law, particularly a case called NCAA v. Board of Regents, which was back in 1984, went to the United States Supreme Court, and that case wasn't about pay playing, paying players. It was instead about whether or not the NCAA could restrict the number of TV broadcasts that schools can have. The NCAA <laughs> created rules on how many broadcasts the school could have. The NCAA lost that case, but in that case, the Supreme Court noted that, well, it makes sense under antitrust law that there are rules of amateurism, perhaps that allow the NCAA for players not to be compensated. But in, in, in response, O'Bannon has argued, well, that's missing the point. We're not talking about paying players for their labor. We're talking about paying them for their image and likeness. And that's a key distinction. That is not paying players a salary. It's not, well, you know, that guy averaged 18, 18 points a game, so he should get a contract commensurate with an NBA player who averaged 18 points a game. No, it's their face. It's <coughs> their appearance. It's their, it's their gestures. It's really who they are, which Alexander Roberts is going to talk more about in a moment. The case is currently in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California, and Judge Susan, Susan Wilkin has, is, has to make a crucial decision coming up, and that's whether or not O'Bannon should be able to sue on behalf of potentially tens of thousands of other athletes. It's the class certification question. Class certification essentially means you want to bring a lawsuit, not just you, but on behalf of a class of individuals that can opt out if they don't want to be in it. The judge has to decide whether or not it's appropriate for literally tens of thousands of former athletes and current ones who played Division I basketball and football to be part of the same lawsuit. The NCAA has argued, wait a second, players are very different. There are some players who generate a lot of revenue perhaps for their school, others who maybe are fortunate to be getting a scholarship, others who don't generate revenue for their schools. They shouldn't be in the same lawsuit. Now, O'Bannon has argued, well, we're not arguing paying them differently. They all get paid the same amount. That's a key point because that advances the class certification argument. The judge at any day, and thankfully it wasn't today, <laughs> <laughs> I did look at my phone, has to decide whether or not to certify the class. If the judge does that, and this is crucial, if the judge does that, I would expect the NCAA to seek a settlement of the case. Because the last nope. thing the NCAA wants... Nope. 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 Okay, well, we'll talk about... We'll argue that. The case could potentially be a, a billion-dollar case because players would be compensated for all of the past use of their image and likeness. Two parties to the case, Electronic Arts and the Collegiate Licensing Company, have already reached a settlement with O'Bannon. Now, it's a proposed settlement. It still has to be approved by the judge. But it looks like right now it's one-on-one. It's -on -one. O'Bannon v. NCAA. So the antitrust case, again, is whether or not the schools, the 
the NCAA and its conferences are joined hands to prevent others from doing their own deals. And I'll turn it over to Alex. Uh, <clears throat> before we turn it over to Alex, I, I, I'm remiss uh, if I didn't introduce one of our panelists um, <coughs> who's from UNH, so shame on me. Oh. Um, <laughs> the athletic director here at UNH, um, and also the National Association um, of Collegiate Athletic Directors AD of the Year in 2007. Please welcome Marty Scarano. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hands for doing right. um, I, I know Sonny especially is going to have some um, some strong opinions on this case, but um, this also this case also involves a lot of intellectual property. So Alex Roberts <laughs> is going to give us uh, an overview of some of the inter intellectual property arguments uh, at, at at play here. Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, get this a little closer. I'm going to talk about rights of publicity, both the doctrine and how it's going to play out in O'Bannon or what the issues are. Rights of publicity protect against unauthorized commercial use of a person's name, image, or likeness. I want to parse two pieces of that with you. Uh, first of all, what do we talk about when we talk about name, in, image, and likeness? And second of all, that commercial piece, which is a really key piece. So name, image, or likeness, first of all, um, sometimes appears in pretty obvious forms, like somebody's image on a baseball card. Other times is a little surprising. So the Bette Midler case is a pretty famous one. Uh, Ford came to Bette Midler, said, we want you to sing in a commercial. And she said, no, thank you. So they went out and found somebody who sounded exactly like her. So the consumers would believe it was her voice. So uh, Midler recovered about $400,000 in that case on a right of publicity theory. More recent case you might be aware of, um, <laughs> Kim Kardashian sued Old Navy because Old Navy went out looking for, or appeared to go out looking for, a Kardashian lookalike. We would love to have Kim Kardashian. We don't feel like paying for her. Let's find somebody who looks enough like her to fool some people, right? That's going to implicate rights of publicity. The car you see there in the corner of the slide is a really interesting case. Um, that was a situation in which a car was used in an advertisement, but the car wasn't just any car. It was so closely associated with a specific race car driver that the race car driver um, made the successful argument that it was exploiting his right of publicity, exploiting his fame. Because when people saw that ad, they would say, hey, it's this guy, it's this race car driver who's out here endorsing this product, when in fact he wasn't endorsing it, he wasn't making mon any money off of it. Lastly, we have the Vanna White case, um, which is another fun one. Samsung put this ad out essentially saying, in the distant future, in the year 2012, Jeopardy will be run by robots, but you'll still be taping it on your Samsung VCR, which is pretty hilarious now that it's 2013, and we know that Vanna White is still around, but Samsung VCRs are pretty much completely defunct, right? <laughs> so White sued, and she said, look, this is me. It's not my photo. It's not my specific name or a, a image of me, a drawing of me, but it, it's a robot Vanna White. Anybody can see. And she was successful in that argument. Uh, but I want to I wanna hone in now on that commercial piece. In this case, and, and this is a little early for some of you, in fact, it's a little bit early even for me, but Dustin Hoffman was in a movie called Tootsie, and he cross-dressed in that movie. This is a page from Los Angeles Magazine in which they took a photo of Dustin Hoffman from the movie poster and uh, photoshopped him into a different outfit. And it was part of a spread in LA Magazine showing off the designs of some of these designers. Hoffman sued and he said, hey, wait a minute. You're using my image without my permission. How could that possibly be OK? He won at district court, and then the case was overturned on First Amendment grounds. The appeals court said, look, this isn't really a commercial use of the type that we're concerned about. This is an expressive, an artistic use that happened inside the pages of the magazine. <laughs> so uh, Hoffman, you don't get anything. Right? Another important case or an important example of this is um, you can see this likeness of the Three Stooges. So here we have an artist who does charcoal renditions of the Three Stooges and some others. And it's a pretty loyal rendition. Right? There's a photograph next to it. They look very, very similar. The court in this case and in a number of rights of publicity type cases asks a question about the consumers, about the audience, asks the question, 
well, who are the people who are buying this art and why are they buying it? Is it because they enjoy the artist's work? Is it because they think it's an important piece of art or they enjoy the skill of this particular person? Or is it because they like the Three Stooges? They want a representation of the Three Stooges. So that's an important question and an important distinction to keep in mind when we think about the representations of these players, right? We don't usually think about video games as art or as First Amendment protected speech. But in fact, courts have treated them that way. Courts have said video games generally are protected by the First Amendment. So we might ask this question. If you buy the video game, are you doing it because you love electronic arts? You think they make great games? You have a bunch of other EA games? You want to play it. You don't really care that much um, if you're playing it because of the specific players or just because it's a great game. Conversely, are you such a hardcore Sam Keller fan? You ran out to get the game because you want to be Sam Keller. Any game that incorporates him, you're going to play it and you're going to be excited about it, right? That's going to factor into our analysis. So where do rights of publicity come into play? They, they sometimes uh, do with the Federal Lanham Act. Camera's a little distracting. Um, <laughs> Not at issue in O'Bannon, but we would see this, for example, if somebody snapped a picture of Ed O'Bannon chugging some Gatorade, it was a great picture, Gatorade picked it up and said, well, we're going to make this a national campaign, put it in some magazines, look, it's Ed O'Bannon and he loves Gatorade, right? O'Bannon then would have a claim under the Federal Lanham Act, which covers not just trademark, but false advertising, false association and endorsement. Here we're really focused on state statutes and state common law. 19 different states have enacted statutes to protect rights of publicity, um, not just for celebrities. In some states, they explicitly apply to people like you and me, right? Um, 28 different states protect rights of publicity under the common law, but there's some overlap there. So there are states that have both statutory and common law protection and states that have neither. Now, I want to point that out to you uh, that this is this right is not a given, okay? There are states who think there's nothing to protect. There are scholars who think that this is kind of a waste of time. So we focus on the states where the protection is broadest. That's where we see the case law. The contract will also come into play here, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So state right of publicity statutes, you're going to see pretty strong ones in New York and California. We're going to see a lot of litigation there, right? We have a lot of celebrities there who want to exercise their rights. We'll also see really strong protection in Indiana. And back on this name likeness issue, some other things are explicitly listed. So gestures, mannerisms, if you, if you pull your ear at the end of every performance, that um, somebody could use that as a reference to you, right? Signature is also covered here in some states and not in others. So this is a body of law that really varies from one state to the next. I wanted to put up these images because um, I, think, I think they're really persuasive. We have Ed O'Bannon over here and we have, what? Could anybody tell me that doesn't look like Ed O'Bannon? <laughs> EA used the height, the weight, the skin tone, the schools, the jersey numbers. Um, if, if, a, if an athlete got injured over the course of the season, you might see that injury pop up in the game. They had just about everything in there except for the names of the players. But guess what? As you might know, users could upload a roster. There was a workaround that would then merge the players' names with the players themselves and do the matching. Unless you think that's just a hack um, or, or something that users could do without the permission of the game creator, <laughs> EA was on board. Um, Electronic Arts actively promoted that feature. They said, check out this great feature. We acknowledge it's a selling point. It's something people want. Here you have Sam Keller, same thing. I think this is, this is a really loyal um, reproduction of him. As Professor McCann mentioned, um, the claims against EA for the most part have settled. So what we're really focused on now is live game broadcasts and some other things around the broadcast. And actually, that's where the money is. There's a lot more money at issue when we, when we talk about broadcasts of actual games than there is for the video games. The California statute, the Indiana statute, and a lot of state statutes have explicit carve-outs. So the California statute says, there's an, ex there's an exception for uses in connection with news, public affairs, political campaigns, or sports broadcasts. Essentially, this is an issue of, of, of public concern. This is something that's happening that people want to know about. So you're not going to be able to assert a right of publicity that would circumvent that. There's nothing explicit in the California common law, but typically they're um, analyzed together. When you have a, a common law and a statutory claim, 
for something like this, um, the, the carve out in the statute tends to govern. But let's, let's, look about, let's look at what the plaintiffs in O'Bannon are actually talking about. They go beyond broadcasts. They're talking about rebroadcasts of classic games. They're talking about highlight films. They're talking about stock footage sold to corporate advertisers. Right? So it's one thing to say, you play on this college team and the, we can broadcast the footage. That's part of the deal. Right? That seems fair. But the players, the former players, are saying more than that. They're saying, what about 5, 10, 15 years later? What about, you know, I, there's this fantastic shot of O'Bannon slam dunking. You want to use that and you want to make that part of your ad campaign for, um, for the games or for something else you do on a television station. You're just going to play it over and over. Some people would think it makes sense for O'Bannon to then speak up and say, it seems like I should be uh, looped back in for this. seems like I should be remunerated or otherwise involved in this, what, what becomes an endorsement, right? If you're selling footage to corporate advertisers, there's something more going on there than just broadcast footage. Lastly, I mentioned contracts. Um, Form 083A is something that athletes have to sign for their eligibility for their scholarships. <laughs> It's very vague, as you can see. You authorize the NCAA to use your name and picture um, to promote championships, events, activities, programs. So it's kind of amorphous. You can see how arguments are being made on each side, I think, about, about whether really this, this encompasses all kinds of rights of publicity or just some limited rights. Um, I know we have a lot of law students in the room, too, so, so you're probably concerned about contract law right now. You're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. Um, the, the consideration for this contract is maybe four years of eligibility. Is it really going to govern in perpetuity? Is it going to apply to somebody who's 52 years old just because maybe he played these games in college and he signed this contract so many years ago? Or is it a contract of adhesion? Is it against public policy? Right. So these issues are, are all in play. I'm going to turn it back over to you, BJ. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. Um, before we dive into the specific issues, I would like to go to our remaining panelists. Um, <clears throat> And starting, uh, starting with you, Alan, and just get uh, briefly what this case means to you um, and what the key issues that you see are. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think what it means to me is I've advocated for some time that uh, athletes should not be restricted from selling their own images, uh, selling, you know, getting... Uh, shoe contracts, you know, they are essentially exploited while they are playing football or, or basketball. They, they run the risk of some serious injuries. And uh, they should be, you know, since many of them uh, come from poor backgrounds, uh, it, the scholarships simply aren't, aren't enough to compensate them. You know, at, at the uh, University of New Hampshire, when you have a hockey game, before you throw the fish out onto the uh, ice, uh, <clears throat> the student ticket takers get paid an hourly. The, uh, the, the students who work in the vending areas where the food is distributed, they get paid. So why shouldn't the players es essentially get the same kind of compensation for working for the university? I don't think there's any reason why they should not. And hopefully, uh, as a result of this case, and we'll, we'll see some real significant changes. Thank you, Alan. Sonny, I know you have some strong feelings on this. I don't have enough time to speak on them, though, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm uh, in a web here with time constraint. You know, saying what Alan said, and basically you all know about the case, I assume, my, my whole thing when it all started, you know, prior to O'Bannon, was the rights of the individuals. Now, you can go back and document what you think or don't think of me as a human being, as an advocate or not an advocate. It's, it's, it doesn't make any difference. What you have to understand is you're dealing with individuals that basically have no say in what they're doing. And the very fact that we acknowledge that they get a scholarship, we acknowledge that they sign a piece of paper to sign over the rights to their images forever, tells me it's some sort of compensation. I mean, from, from the get-go, they are the scholarship is compensation. Just so we all understand that. They just put it into a clever word because they had a brilliant man in an unbrilliant time named Walter Byers. He came up with a way to frame everything and make it look like these were specific individuals. And we are now going to call them student athletes. 
There's nothing in your curriculum at any university in all the world that signifies a, another, you guys are in law, you're in business, whatever your major is, no one refers to you as a student law student. No one refers to you as a student doctor. They pick out something that doesn't even have a curriculum, athletics. There's no major in athletics, there should be probably, and they should get their degree in athletics. My point is, it's a fraud pretense in the beginning. The organization in itself, I'm not advocating the wild, wild west, and I never have. But what I advocate is it's a flawed system. The very word amateurism does not apply to this group of people because amateurism is, is, a, is, a, is a ridiculous remark used by a very wealthy group of people in England a long time ago to differentiate between the working class and the ones who had everything, the ones that owned the castles. There's separation here of the individual and the institution, and they do it they do it on their own terms. Moses came down from the, the, the high mountain and gave us 10 commandments. I'll give, he talked to a higher authority, and I'll assume it was somebody that I have no contact with right now, but I pray to God that I meet him. <laughs> but the NCAA has their own rules that they impose on these individuals, men, women, that only benefits them. There's nothing in their rules. Go through 2,899 pages that said, the athlete shall be able to go get a free dinner. The athlete shall be able to do this. It's they shall not do this. They shall not do that. It's a one-sided case. You have a group of individuals that do nothing but profit, profit, profit off them, and I don't mind that because on the other side of this mountain that I'm on, I want these people to profit. I want them to share with the athlete. I don't know if you really understood, it's a human rights issue here. These individuals are being deceived and tricked. Any other thing, you can have bias on an athlete, you can have an opinion on one, you can think they may or may not go to school because the NCAA puts in their, in their, their advertising, you may think we're dumb jocks, that's the most appalling thing I've ever seen out of supposedly educated people. By that statement, they imply that you do think that. I never thought of that. I would think they're intelligent human beings because those people that think they're dumb jocks admitted them to their universities. <laughs> yes, that's fact. You don't think of it that way because you will look at these individuals as freaks, as you know, people who have really no place on it. They live by themselves. You're right. Most of them have athletic dorms. They do. Built by the school. They travel by themselves. They have their own set of tutors that travel with them. I don't know which one of you guys, if you have to go home, they're going to send from New Hampshire, they're going to send you a tutor to spend time with you. If you're an athletic member and you go to one of these trips, they send tutors. That's all well and good. I'm saying to you, and I'll come back, and I, I apologize for going long. Tell this, us what you really think. It's though. a very, <laughs> very, very, very important case. It's an individual, it's a rights case. It's not paying somebody something. You pay somebody for doing something that you acknowledge they're doing, okay? These men and women have earned it because they've been used. And if it's the cost of the scholarship, then I say to you, let me pay for my scholarship and let me bargain my own rights. Thank you, Sonny. <clears throat> Those of you who have never met or heard Sonny speak before, you, you know why we love him so much. <laughs> Um, Marty, uh, sorry you have to follow it's quite a Sonny. <laughs> quite a rebuttal. <laughs> but from, Marty, you uh, have an interesting vantage point from, yes. you're coming from the administrative uh, angle. So how do you see it? I see it quite differently. And as I was asked by Mike, and I'm honored to serve on this panel, I was trying to ascertain what my role would be. It's very clear to me. I'm going to be the antagonist. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm here to persuade you otherwise. I guess I would say this without going on too long. Um, we all have strong opinions on this matter, and it is very important, and it is a landmark case. I do not see it quite the same way that my two colleagues on the panel see it. I see it quite differently. I don't want to be perceived as being naive and innocent. I've spent 34 years doing what I do, which is advocating for student athletes, trying to mentor student athletes, and try to lead them to become better people. And every single person just about that I know in my 34 years that have done what I do perceive ourselves as educators, 
and role models. And I will also tell you that in the great majority of student athletes, and probably now in my time, over four institutions, thousands of them, look at their years in college athletics and the privilege that they had to receive scholarship and support through those institutions for their experiences the greatest time of their lives. I want to remind everybody of one thing. We're not talking about Michael Jordans every day. 99.9% .9 of the student athletes in Division I are anonymous people that love their institutions, feel they're getting a very good deal, and are happy for it. Now that doesn't mean that they're not entitled to own their image. I clearly believe they are entitled to own their own image. I clearly believe that they're entitled to be compensated for their image and whatever they achieve on the field. But I feel very strongly that compensation, remuneration, shouldn't transpire during their time that they are exercising their eligibility. And another complication, and there are many, many complications, and I could go on and be just as passionate as Sonny because I'm Italian as well. <laughs> Another real, I, another. I don't speak because of that. Don't we're both, we're both, we're both <laughs> Pittsburghers too, by the way. Yes. Um, another complication, and this is really accelerated in our business, and I caution to call it a business, but make no mistake, intercollegiate athletics is a business. I've always believed that. These gentlemen believe it, and it is a business. But we have to ascertain where is the value added. Clearly, Michael Jordan added value to North Carolina. But Michael Jordan chose to go to North Carolina, which has a wonderful, long legacy in basketball excellence, and he benefited by being associated with North Carolina. Any football player that plays for the University of Alabama benefits by being associated with the University of Alabama and all the commensurate value that that lends to his image. So I think that's something I want everyone to keep in mind. And again, there aren't many Michael Jordans and Johnny Manziels out there. 99% of these folks are supporting their institutions and their teammates. And, then, and the last thing I'll say is, I live in the day-to-day -day reality of trying to create equity and value among all of my student athletes, whether they be field hockey players, swimmers, football players, or Hobie Baker winners in ice hockey, which is what UNH is, is proud of and most no, no, known for. So thank you again. <clears throat> Thanks, Marty. Um, Charlie, you've represented NBA players for many, many years. Do you see similarities here? <clears throat> yeah, I, I kind of see the case a little differently. Um, and most of you would probably wonder, well, why is this guy from the union here? Uh, but <laughs> I see it quite differently. I, I see it as an opportunity because I do believe the O'Bannon case is analogous to similar cases that we've had in professional sports. Uh, namely Oscar Robertson case and namely the John Mackey case in football. And I say that because it gives an opportunity for both sides, both labor, and I do consider college athletes labor, uncompensated or non-compensated labor, but still labor. Um, but I see it as an opportunity to create a balance, a more balanced relationship between those who run colleges and universities and those who kids, those kids who play, uh, taking many risks, uh, playing what we call professional, not professional, but college basketball or college football with a, quote, aura of professionalism. And I say that because the uh, amount of money that's being generated uh, in the NFL this year could be upwards to 12 to $14 billion. <coughs> if we take a look at the super conferences and the kind of revenue they generate, they generate it the same way, but their expenses are less because they don't pay, quote, these young college athletes. And what I would like to see out of the O'Bannon case is that I would like to see them get the class, and I would like the class to apply enough pressure on the NCAA to change the way they do business with young college athletes. We talk about rights, we talk about privileges, we talk about opportunity, we talk about balance. There's no balance in college athletics when it comes to that, from that standpoint. Um, there's no one that represents college athletes. There is someone that represents the president of your university. There is someone who represents your athletic director. There is someone that represents your college coach. And if, in fact, the university can pay a coach a million dollars, then guess what? somebody is making enough money to compensate these young people, perhaps in a different way. 
Perhaps they get deferred income. Perhaps that income isn't cashed in until they graduate. There are many things that can be worked out. Revenue sharing is something that we've done in professional sports for many years. And it's the same thing. We're reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Revenue sharing for athletes should not be new. That's something that should happen. And uh, I think the O'Bannon case could be the landmark case to make things like that happen. And quite frankly, give uh, the athletes a seat at the table. Thanks, Charlie. Pete, you and I are probably the only unbiased observers here. So uh, what does this case mean to you as someone who has been in college athletics and covering college sports for years? Sure. Well, I think that, uh, that my role is, I think, very different than everyone else on the panel, other than, I guess, Michael. It is that I'm, I, have no, I have no stake in it. I'm somewhere between, between uh, Sonny and the athletic director of New Hampshire, Michael. We're, you know, it's just, we, we try to, I try to look at it, I guess, in a, in a pragmatic perspective. And when I think about the O'Bannon case as it's unfolded the past couple of years, I think about the, uh, the kind of the ticking clock on 60 Minutes as, you know, when they, when they go in to tease the show. And it's a, it's a crossroads for, uh, for college sports right now. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the NCAA, and the NCAA is sort of flailing in all these different directions. Directions. Yet at the same time, college sports have never been more popular. They've never been more more fiscally forward. I mean, you have, uh, as, as Charles just mentioned, you have billion-dollar television contracts, and it's predicated on free labor. And as that's emerged, there's you know a million-dollar black market, which incidentally, Sonny played a big part in forming as well. Absolutely, and, and we love him for it. <laughs> um, that that's kind of emerged because of this free labor, and it's uh, there's just an intense amount of pressure in different places. And you have to think: Is this the bubble? I mean, you have something that's booming, and at the same time, it's very existence is being threatened and so as, as a journalist covering this it's been a it's been a fascinating exercise to see all the different pressure points uh, play out as you can as you can hear and, and see there are many strong opinions about this case um, and uh, we're fortunate to be joined by many passionate uh, advocates here so let's get right into the issues I mean I think one of the biggest issues facing us now as we are in the case is certification um, should this be certified as a class and why or why not? Just before we get into this d debate, this judge, Claudia Wilkin, um, is no stranger to class action suits. And in fact, she usually certifies cases. Uh, Mike, I know you did an analysis of 29 of her orders on class certification from 1998 to 2013, and here are the findings. Judge Wilkin denied certification only six times, 21%. She granted certification 18 times, 62% of the time, and she partially uh, granted certification five times, 17% uh, of the time. So I ask you, should this be certified as a class? I think if we look at her past in terms of being consistent and that she has taken a fairly flexible approach to certifying classes, O'Bannon is poised to be certified. I think that is clearly the case, if one were betting, and one shouldn't, but if one were betting on certification, uh, I, I, I would absolutely say that she will likely certify. To me, uh, one issue is that I, and I know Alan is going to talk about this, is the fact that O'Bannon has argued that they should be paid the same in the settlement. And that's a key point because that emphasizes that they're all part of the same group. The judge has to be very careful in deciding to, to group them all together because I think you know, one could make an argument that the college athlete varies in terms of talent, in terms of marketability. You know, look at O.J. Mayo one year at USC, the television ratings that went up. If you take another player one year at USC, there would be no impact. Should they really be in the same group? But I think O'Bannon has argued with expert testimony that, no, they should be in the same group because they should be getting the same compensation just by being there. So I, I credit to the O'Bannon team and their strategy. I think they were very smart. To, to recognize that even though intuitively we're thinking, God, I don't, they're really different athletes. They've taken the opposite approach to say for purposes of the case, they're one. And I, if I, again, I think chances are that the case is certified. I think there is, though, a chance that she's going to say, I don't think former and current players should be in the same group. Because the mechanics of compensating current players is quite different from that of compensating retired and former players. And she may argue, I don't think we should combine them. The, the process by which they would be compensated would be different. For current players, there would presumably be a trust. Uh, for former players, no, no such trust would exist. So I could see that happening. But again, chances are she certifies the class. 
from a legal argument, um, and I'm going to kick this to you, Alex. There, there are four key components to certify a class, and those are numerosity, commonality, typicality, and adequacy. Um, could you explain those and, and how it applies to this case? I, <laughs> I might kick that back to Mike because I know he's an expert in this area, but I'm just thinking about um, from a rights of publicity perspective, you know, the strongest claims are really going to come from the people with the star power. And that's, as, as several of the panelists mentioned, that's a really limited number of athletes. So when we're thinking about typicality, when we're thinking about people having consistent claims across an entire class, um, there may be a stronger argument on the antitrust side, but I think you run into some trouble on the intellectual property side, right? Um, we're concerned about commercial use of the name, the likeness, the image, the mannerisms, the personality. Um, that we're concerned about what's going to what's going to get people tuning in, what's going to sell games, right? And that's not going to be common ground for all the different players. Alan, you've represented many athletes. As a matter of law, how how do you see this? Well, I, I come from a different perspective. So I've done a number of class actions, and. <clears throat> My good friend Sonny, I think, is praying that this, that this class gets certified. And I think the, the press is sort of writing that if it doesn't get certified, then the case is over. And, and I just don't think that's, that's correct. I, I think the judge may not certify the class. But if O'Bannon proceeds as an individual claim and the judge rules that, Mr. O'Bannon, you're entitled to be paid for your likeness, then it doesn't really matter if the class is not certified. There's going to be, I mean, that issue is going to go up to the Ninth Circuit and it may go up to the Supreme Court. If the law is that individual athletes are entitled to be paid for their likeness, if the law is that individual athletes can negotiate individual contracts with shoe companies, then the game's over, Sonny. And the, and the same result that, that you pray for is going to be achieved. It will. So, you know, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of, uh, <clears throat> you know, emphasis on, gee, if class certification has not happened, this case is over. And I just think completely the opposite. I think it's actually a better case as an individual case because the, the, the issues get much more simplified. It's simply Ed O'Bannon saying, hey, I've been out of basketball <laughs> for 20 years. They're making money on my image. I think that's an easy case. Charlie? Well, I think you go, again, down to practice and what actually happens. I mean, in football, basketball, baseball, and hockey on a professional level, they have what's called group license. And they sell as much marketing uh, equipment, uh, as many sponsorships as any one individual. Uh, you know, we had a guy named Michael Jordan who was part of our group license. All the players received the same amount of money because Michael decided, along with others, that a group license meant equality. Um, the practical side of this thing says, again, that if the NCAA were smart, they would create a group license and share it with the players and end the litigation. I mean, that would be the smartest thing to do. In negotiations, when you look and calculate your losses and do a cost-benefit analysis, I cannot believe that they think they're going to win this on a class action basis. So they should be talking about settlement now. They should <laughs> simply say, one of the ways we can do, invite the young people in and say, you know what, you guys are our partners going forward with regard to group licensing. And here's how we're going to divide the, the asset that uh, each year of uh, participation in your uh, uh, sport is one unit. And at the end of the four years, you got four units, and we go out from there. I mean, that's what we do at the professional level. Again, it's not to reinvent the wheel, but let's not separate the idea that people are working, people are being promoted, and people are being exploited. The question is, what is balance here? We look around, we, we think about the NCAA all of these years. We've gone from thousands of dollars to billions of dollars. You know, in 1983, I testified in Congress at the time for Herschel Walker. And the same people lined up on the other side and said, you know what? We don't believe Herschel Walker should be able to leave school as a junior and sign a professional contract uh, for millions of dollars. And they lined up 
to come and testify on behalf of the NCAA to make it ineligible or to players have players ineligible if they didn't spend the four seasons in college. Those are the kind of things, that was 1983. This is 2013, all right? Balance, and when can we see that this thing can be negotiated in a way that makes sense for everybody? Yeah, I think this goes into our next point. I'm gonna give you the first word on this, Marty, and feel free to circle back to this, but a key uh, argument here is, is the whole amateurism argument. Right. Um, are college athletes really amateurs at the highest level? I would contend that they are amateurs. The great majority of them are amateurs, as I said in my opening remarks. And again, I just want to remind people that we're talking about a very exclusive minority subset of Division I athletes in reference to this, this discussion, this argument. I mean, we keep using the word asset. I, I want to tell you that there are less than 40 Division I institutions. There are 351 Division I institutions, of which UNH is one. There are less than 40 that generate a net surplus at the end of the year. Everyone else is running deficit budgets, highly subsidized by the university, and furthermore, more problematic, and it's certainly a problem for us at UNH, subsidized by the student body through student fees. There is no distribution of revenue at schools like UNH, which make up the majority of Division I institutions. And I will contend that if this case were certified, and we're talking about divestment of assets, it's going to be anything but. It's going to be the end of intercollegiate athlete, athletics as we know it. But who's the, the highest paid, who's the highest I, I paid person at UNH? Well, we know who is, that is. is, is, it, is it He's the not the highest is, paid, is by it, the way. President Huddleston's the highest paid at UNH. But, but Dick Umilly, as, as you're referring to, has been compensated well. And again, we do market value, and he's compensated considerably lower than his market value is nationally because it is UNH. Um, Excuse me. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I ask you a question? You just, you just <laughs> said what I said. You figured out for this individual you're talking about market value, and you compensate him accordingly. Mm -hmm. You also said three or four times, and I respect you tremendously, and I understood where you were coming from before you started, because this is, you are an educator, mm -hmm. and your sport is not a revenue-producing sport. See, what you didn't tell these people out here is 99 and 44% of all the athletes in college 1% of those people pay everybody's wage, pay everything, they pay all the schools, excuse me, Marty, none of you guys make money. You just said 40 schools are only one, only 40. Mm -hmm. You get money because of what? The NCAA tournament. You get money because, and I don't want to go into it, but what are you doing? These kids are the ones playing. They've got to pay your scholarship? Come on, where else in life do I have to work to supply your scholarship? Just let me pay my own. I, I, I don't, this is very, I understand where you're going. I respect what you said. You're talking about Olympic type athletes. When you get statistics, you're talking about kids that get one fourth scholarship, one third scholarship. They're walk-ons. Don't tell me about the swimmers, the track and field, not that they're less people. In fact, they are in all probability your best students. I would bet that and I will tell you something else for a fact. I would bet in all probability they are not in a minority race. Okay, let's understand what we're doing here. A certain small group of individuals pay the taxes for everybody in college sports. And the word amateurism was just like the English did with the working class, you signified. Charles said down there, you can go pro in everything other than what? Football and basketball. Are you nuts? Why can't you, and I know your hockey guys do it because they don't have to even go out of high school, the hockey kids can come. No, I'm schooled. Baseball players can go and come back. Football and basketball players are tied by an, an unreasonable, unearthly, ungodly joint union with the professional leagues. Football won't let you come for three years. Basketball said one and done. Screw the education. Don't get, Marty, I respect you, and please, any, I am not, I am, I under, I'm for him. I'm for all the great kids. No, I am. The real, the real part of university is such. The kids go, they play, and they're the ones that have the great experience. I want you to tell the one, because you're right, only 1% of 1% make it. 
I want you to tell some of the horror stories that maybe Mr. Thamel was alluding to to the public. I don't think he understood when there's an underbelly around there. You know this, the, the truth about that? Pete was right. There is an underbelly that consists of what? The recruiters, the people who are involved with kids, but there's only one consistent partner to anything in the underbelly. It's the buyer and the seller. Your universities are the people who deal with the underbelly. And I'm tired of protecting the schools. What the hell do you think you have here? Is this some religious do domination that, that you can just give in? Well, we've seen what happens in government, in clergy, and everything. But we fail to understand that the individuals that pay in the monetary sports on your campuses support everything and they are the most demonized individuals on your campus. So I don't, I don't buy, I don't buy all the good, all those kids are good and, the, and the, your ad says I'm, I'm going to be a dog catcher and I'm not going to be a professional and I'm never going to be, well that's good, but you know what, how about if they thank those guys, guys down here in the final four. You know, thank you basketball players for giving up your life, your sword, everything else and giving up your academics and probably, giving up a lot of things. You paid my scholarship. Damn, that's a really good thing. I, I just don't buy into this, this purity of college. The, the college situation at, at New Hampshire is beautiful. It is pure. I'm agreeing with you. I spoke at Ohio University two weeks ago. 60 the, miles. The Ohio yeah, State No, 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 no. Ohio University in Athens. Oh, okay. 60 <laughs> miles away. They had 108,000 people in the stands. And you want me to tell you about their things? And let me just go on Johnny Manziel. I'm glad you picked out Johnny because I'm glad Johnny's white and he's rich. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And this guy from Texas A&M yesterday may have the audacity to say that the Heisman Trophy winner uh, trophy and Johnny Manziel meant nothing to the, the finances of Texas A&M. Well, isn't that interesting? Then why in the hell did Phil Knight buy a billboard in Times Square to, to produce some guy named Joey Harrington to win the hyphen? Why do all the athletic departments and all the PR departments in colleges and universities spend money to promote their athletes? Why do you people put up Michael Jordan, James Worthy, this guy, this guy? Why do you do that? You do it for the alumni and to get students to come. These athletes make enrollment go up and people buy things. Do you, you gotta quit demonizing them. I'm tired of the demonizing, and I understand one thing. You know, Mr. My good friend here thinks that whatever this is an easy. The only people that profit, that profit by this, are people who live in Indianapolis and the people that get paid, get paid to run bowl games. Do you people understand? Do you understand what a Chick Fil A play bowl is? You don't give a damn, but I know that there are individuals that play in that game that make more money than this whole room put together. And let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else, okay, on the Chick-fil-A play and the BCS. They pick 13 people to run the BCS. And they're going to pick all the, from all these teams, they're going to pick four. Do you know what they're doing? They're playing 14 games of football. Four schools, four teams are going to play four. Did anybody ask them if they're going to get concussions? If they're going to miss class? Did they ask the players if they want to play more? Nobody asked the players anything. That was my statement. I apologize, I, I mean it. But you, you've got to understand, you're, you're, when I started this crusade, I wanted to go to the Harvards, the Yells. I didn't want to go to football and basketball. I've seen all those kids. I know their plight. I prayed to God that there's people like you that will write and say things that it's an unequal thing. This is not about amateurism. Marty, we're talking about two different things here. I think we're talking about one one set of people, and we're we're yeah. talking about the rest. And I think you oh. you you're on the rest. And I and well, what I want to tell Sonny is I agree with you, Sonny. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I want to be please clear. And I I, I agree with all that you said to the extent that there is a dark underbelly. There's there's a lot of things that take place that none of us are proud of. But it's about how we classify the rest of us. And if we embrace intercollegiate athletics and we love the basketball tournament, particularly the first two rounds, where a school like UNH, and it's going to be one of these days, a school like UNH <laughs> is going to be seated against Duke, that's what the populace loves. And I, I will just say this about amateurism. I think that there is a, a guise of amateurism. We sell amateurism. I'm not, I'm, but I don't agree with it because the student athletes are labor. It's a matter of how they're dealt with at their particular institution. The populace loves the amateur connotation. 
and schools market that on the backs of student athletes. We'll talk about solutions later in the program and we will change the policy. But Pete, let, let's just talk about the underbelly and then I'm gonna go to you, Charlie, because we've talked about this before. Pete, you've, you've obviously covered the underbelly and, and are very familiar with it. Wherein lies the problem? <laughs> well, it, the underbelly has evolved to a point now and it's gone on, as, as Sonny can know, for decades and decades and in different ways and it's taken on different mannerisms. It was boosters and it's mm -hmm. evolved to agents in different mm -hmm. ways. And this is in terms of paying recruits and, and luring people to campus in order to make hundreds of millions of dollars at those select schools. And then those are also the schools that get paid billions in the, in, in the large television contracts. And the, the underbelly is almost like an accepted part of it all now. You know, it's, it's become almost casual in, in the way kids are literally bought and sold, agents place people there. It's just, if when you talk to coaches and, and you live in that world, it is a very common part of the backdrop conversation. You'll talk to coaches, like, ah, he, he costs too much. I, I, we, we, we couldn't take him. We couldn't deal with his people. I mean, these kids have per se representation, even though they're not allowed to have representation. They have people, middlemen, uncles, mentors, however you want to, you know, they're, 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 the terminology uh, the terminology varies. And uh, and I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but it's sort of part of the part of the backdrop, and it's it's part of the collegiate landscape as you know it. And if you choose not to navigate it, uh, I would say 95% of the time you're going to basically choose not to compete. Charlie, I know you you have strong feelings that unions can help uh, play a role in getting rid of some of this underbelly. Well, I think uh, first of all, let's go back to the amateur <clears throat> definition. I mean, who defines amateur? The NCA defines amateur that suits their best interests. Um, if I asked all of you to define amateur, you'd have a totally different view of what you consider an amateur. Certainly not someone who would see, receive $50,000 a year, although it'd be in a scholarship form. So amateur is all relative, and quite frankly, for this discussion, you really discard amateur, because amateur really doesn't exist. We know about the underbelly. The underbelly is the cost, supply, and demand system that most of the major colleges and universities <coughs> are very much involved with. Um, now, there's only one group in America that really controls the agents, other than some of these state statutes, and that's the respective labor unions. And so one of the things that I've always felt was important in the solution to all this was that if, in fact, the unions were able to be the exclusive bargaining unit for the players, that the exchange, the thing that the NCA would get best, is that they would have then an arm to help clear up some of the underbelly. Because I, or when my former job, could decertify and could regulate agents. The NCA does not have that authority. They can't subpoena uh, agents who may be uh, misbehaving. They can't bring them in and interview and then have them te have testimony and punish them, whereas the unions can. So part of this solution could very well be if cooler heads would prevail and would sit down and say, how do we balance this thing out for the best of our, for these kids that we represent, would be that in exchange for that representation and your enforcement arm, we could clean up the underbelly. Or certainly we could make a big dent on the under underbelly. I don't know that you'll ever clean it up because you have a group of young people who often come from families who need and you have those who have a unique talent and someone is willing to pay for it. And they want to pay for it because they want to be the number one ranked in, uh, uh, NCAA football champion or basketball champion. Mike, I want to bring in um, NCAA versus Board of Regents here. And um, that, that, is, that is a huge part of this case. Um, it talks about compensation, um, and there's a lot of debate uh, on both sides as to how much that decision, that's a Supreme Court decision uh, in 1983, that will play into this. Yeah, so it is a key decision. The NCAA relies heavily on the Board of Regents case, and in that decision back in 84, the court said, even though the case was really about TV rights, not about players, uh, it, it, she said, well, excuse me, the Supreme Court said, in order to preserve the character and the integrity of college sports, not paying athletes is one possible device of getting there. <clears throat> Judge Ilston, though, in this uh, recent decision said, well, wait a second, it's not quite the point of that case. That case wasn't about paying athletes. It was about TV broadcast rights. In fact, she said she wondered how NCAA amateurism rules 
when scrutinized under antitrust law, and specifically she talked about the college sports market. She identified this new market that a number of commentators have said, well, wait a second, she's opening the door to antitrust analysis of college sports. She's opening the door to looking at group licensing and other aspects of schools and the NCAA joining hands and possibly doing it in a way that, that many would argue is anti-competitive. If, in fact, there's a college sports market that you can separate and study under antitrust law, that's a victory for O'Bannon. That there's actually, a late, there's actually an economic market of college sports that warrants antitrust analysis. That she went there is a victory for the O'Bannon team and I think has to concern the NCAA because she is saying, well, this actually should be studied under antitrust law. Now, just because antitrust law applies doesn't mean it's unlawful, right? There's a difference between application and the results of that application. But to be sure, it's worrisome for the NCAA. Alan, um, what's your interpretation of, of that case and how that applies here to O'Bannon? Well, let me go on again a different, from a different perspective. If you look at the history of the NCAA, the NCAA dates back to the turn of the century. It, had two, it was formed for two reasons. One, because too many student, students who were playing football were getting killed in football. And so the NCAA was formed essentially to protect, to, to develop rules to protect these athletes in the games. Now, how have they done with that, with all this concussion litigation? Not very well. The second reason that the NCAA was formed was because the college presidents said that there's a real danger here that collegiate athletics is going to get commercialized. And so the NCAA was formed to essentially try to decommercialize or keep uncommercialized college athletics. When we think of the NCAA today, all we think about is that they are a commercial enterprise. So they have failed in their two main reasons for being. So what I hope happens as a result of the O'Bannon case is that the NCAA ceases to exist. Colleges don't need the NCAA anymore. Their conferences can regulate the individual colleges. The NCAA's purpose at this point is simply to make money for for itself and for the and for certain schools. So as far as I'm concerned, the Soviet Union <coughs> disappeared. <laughs> the next great autocratic dictatorial monopolistic <laughs> enterprise is the NCAA. Let's get rid of that. So I agree 100% by the way about that. Uh, we do a fine job of governing ourselves. You, you agree yeah. that the NCAA should cease to exist? Yeah. <laughs> you cannot go on record. I didn't with that. say that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, institu specific institutions are perfectly capable of governing themselves, and furthermore, conferences are more interactive in governing institutions. And it's a slippery slope that the NCAA entered into when we kind of decentralized, or I should say, centralized the governance by bringing in the President's Council and doing away with the one vote, one institution format that we used to have at the NCAA convention. And the fact is that there are a select few that govern Division I athletics, and not all of us are at the table. So that, hence, has created a scenario where conferences have become a greater uh, influence on our lives at Division I institutions. So what should we do? Should we blow it up? Should oh, what's this? I think the that's NCAA. That's what you're advocating, right? Getting rid of the I'm NCAA? Not say, no, I did not say that <laughs> on record. He's, He's on the somebody record. Write that down. <laughs> somebody write that down. But I think it's very clear that the NCAA is at a crossroads. And in fact, the athletic Division One athletic directors right now have this movement that we're, we are collectively calling One Voice, where the athletic directors are trying to align themselves and gain more control of the of the uh, Division One athletic programs. Just, Sonny? Yeah, for a second, and mm -hmm. I. This is good. I won't be a second. You're right. <laughs> the only problem we have, the most important people in the whole scheme are the six big commissioners. They are tremendous. Mike Sly is one of the smartest. I've never met him. And the guy running the, the Pac-12, what he's done with There's that Scott. outfit is mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. These guys run everything because they run football. The NCAA tournament in its purity, in what it was intended to be, and I understand what you're saying, at least in that tournament, your school has a chance to get there. 
in football, your school cannot get these riches. See, they've already segregated. Only a few can get there. And these 13 people are going to pick the right four. I mean, I don't know how 13 people can do anything when you're talking about the masses. To stay on I court. wasn't chosen to be one of the 13. No, and I, I know. <laughs> they, they, don't get me started on the 13 who were chosen. But my, my point here is, my point here is, the basketball tournament is such, I think... If, you, if they would have stayed within a realm, because everyone had a say and every kid thought he could play if he went to a Division I school. They all thought of that. I think that was the ultimate dream of an athlete to play in the Final Four or play in the tournament, okay? I don't think the ultimate dream is to play in one of those 65 damn bowl games that they forced on you where the schools, half of them lose money. They force you to buy tickets. They force you to pay all your things. The only one that gets anything, and then you people wait for the crumbs. You wait for Alabama to throw you a crumb. That, that's pathetic, because in reality, in my belief, you are what sports on campus should be. I just think it's a business. It addresses such, and life can go on. Let, let's bring it back to the, the student athletes here. I, I think most people would agree that the scholarship the National Letter of Intent and how it's worded, how it's structured, it's a pretty bad deal. And what people in the general public often don't realize, it's, it's a one-year renewable scholarship. And if, uh, just say, a coach wants to leave a school, um, even if he has a buyout that will be most, most likely paid by the school he's going to, he can go, he's free to go with, without any penalty. But a student athlete will have to sit out a minimum of a year off, sometimes two years if he or she is not given a release, um, and that player could be run off after a year or so. So, Marty, I, I, I kick it to you. You know, how do we rectify the the scholarship and not exploiting the kids with uh, with making them sign a national letter of intent? Well, and furthermore, one thing you didn't say is the fact that the, the real problem is if a coach leaves and a student has signed an NLI, the student is still obligated to go to that sure. school. Yeah. So it is very much an open-ended contract. Th that's a tough one, and we struggle with that. Now, again, we, we, UNH, has no relevance to some of the schools that you've read about in Sports Illustrated. There was an expose on a school in the Midwest recently. Oklahoma State. I'm very uh, familiar uh, with that one. Um, <laughs> we honor our contracts, but we also expect our student-athletes to honor the contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, people might be surprised how many student-athletes do not honor their half of the contract, if you would. It's, again, it's somewhat dramatized. I don't want to say over-dramatized when you pick out worst-case scenarios of schools like the one in the expose that's running kids off. That's atrocious and it's criminal. The fact is, I want to believe at least schools that we associate with honor those contracts, we swallow our mistakes, and we move on. And kids have a fulfilled experience. But, albeit, it is a one, it's a one-year renewable contract. It's because it's one way. The right. kids have no one representing them. If anyone uh, represented that kid at that table, they would not allow such a contract. They have no representation. But, go ahead, Alan. Go ahead, Alan. Here's the hypocrisy of the NCAA. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm sure you all heard about the Penn State debacle. What were the, what were the penalties that the NCAA instituted against Penn State? They, restrict, they reduced the number of scholarships available for the football team. Now, <clears throat> They didn't reduce the amount of football players. And so the consequence of that is that now you have football players playing for Penn State University in a very tough conference who do not have scholarships, who go out there and risk their life and their limbs and do not have scholarships. Don't get paid anything to go out there and risk themselves. And so, you know, it, it, to me, that's just appalling, the way, the way the NCAA has used reducing scholarships, not reducing the numbers of players, but reducing scholarships as a penalty because of the transgressions of the coaches at the, at the Penn State University. And one step further is what Alan didn't say is in, in their unbelievable brilliance, Mr. Emmerich up here, from dictation from the presidents, I'm sure, of all the universities, said to those players who played between 2001 and 2012, you didn't play. You didn't play. All your games were vacated. Your lives were worthwhile, but not one, one thing happened in the athletic program. The players were as innocent as a newborn baby. 
Let's understand that. But this was not uh, an indirect hit on a drone out there where some innocent bystanders got hit. He specifically said, you lost, you didn't play. That's sinful. And you know what? Tell that to that Telefero kid. Remember him? He got paralyzed. He didn't play that day he got paralyzed. Maybe God will give him strength tomorrow and his neck won't be broken anymore. See, I'm sick of this. You people take what they say as gospel. They used to have the last word at the press conference. That's why it went past all those other things. The media would cover them and there'd be no one to argue. And so you believed Walter Byers, Dempsey, you know, Brent, and I'm sure they're all honorable men, as we all are honorable men, right? But they were honorable in what their cause was. Those football players, Alan, and Alan's absolutely correct. Some of them are playing on partial, no scholarship, whatever. But how do they take away games that were played by real human beings that gave their, their body and their soul and their life for that? Because that ingrained in an athlete, win, play to win, play to win. Now they told me I can't. I still can't figure out how they, how they got away with that because they wanted to penalize Penn State and because people in the athletic departments were aware of the most egregious crime ever committed. Nothing, no one's standing here standing up for what happened at Penn State. It happened, it was sinful, but you know what? Those kids on that football and basketball team, they had nothing to do with that, nothing. I want to move on to solutions in a second, but before we do, uh, you know, I think a key argument moving forward in this case is the proposed settlement that just came down a few weeks ago with EA and college licensing. Um, Alex, I'll start with you, um, since it involves intellectual property. How much is that going to impact this case? And we've we've discussed before that it leaves the NCAA as the lone is the lone defendant. Um, well, I, I think it does. It, it takes a lot of the teeth out of the intellectual property arguments, right? Because the strongest claims were around the video games. Those were kind of some of the slam dunk claims. And we saw that in the Hart case as well. We see Judge Wilkin or um, the judge in that case saying essentially, okay, so uh, video games are protected under the First Amendment, but um, in a general sense. But what you're doing here with these athletes and their personas um, is is you're not taking them out of context, right? You don't have Keller in a field of daisies. You have Keller throwing a football, looking the way he looks when he throws a football in his uniform. So it's really precise. Um, we compare it to the Three Stooges case, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a recreation that doesn't have a lot of art to it. It's an exploitation or a use of those players' right to publicity. Um, I think when we look at the, the arguments around the broadcasts, the arguments that remain in O'Bannon, those are, that's going to be more of an uphill battle. Mike? No, I agree. I think, to me, this really puts the NCAA in a difficult position where it lost its two co-defendants. Now there's momentum on a settlement. And, you know, Electronic Arts is in a position where it doesn't have to defend amateurism. It doesn't have to defend this institution. And Sonny has talked about that, where, you know, Electronic Arts is in, is in the business of selling video games. What do they really care if players are paid, right? I mean, they, they care. In fact, you could argue they may be better off if you can put real players in games. They may be more marketable games. So on some level, I've never felt that they were the great adversary of O'Bannon. And I, I think we could see the possibility of them reaching a settlement and really... They're not going to settle. The NCAA is not going to settle this case. <laughs> this is a fight to the you death. You don't think there's going to be any settlement? This is a fight okay. to the death. Even if they certified as a class, they're going to they're going to continue to fight. This is a fight <laughs> to the death. Well, I, I litigated against the NFL. Even they they refused to settle. They had all kinds of outs. No. What I'm praying for, and I am praying, okay, I'm praying that common sense evolves here. And like On the my, NCAA? No. See, I my common sense will come from the people who are really part of the NCAA, the schools, the players, and someone's going to say, what do we need this for? Figure out some way to be equitable with these athletes. Make them whole. Make them want to go to college. And if they don't go, as Charles very well put, if they were there for a portion, then they will share. I never said, and O'Bannon never said, and I know personally, I can speak of myself, ever in any of the speeches I've ever made, 
way back for this case, that I thought an athlete should get money when the game was over, like some boosters may or may not have given to them already. But my point here is, this could all be worked out. And there's a man named Kenneth Feinberg that I've been honored to meet in the last year and a half, who has done, he just finished up the settlement on the Penn State case. He's done, he's doing the Boston Marathon. He did the BP, and he, he is, he is respected on both parties, okay? He's with a group of people being put together until we get, this case gets to court and that can happen. Has told me personally, Sonny, the easiest thing to do in life is distribute money if you know how much you have and who the claimants are. He said, then you go into the human part of it in, 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 in Agent Orange, you may not have been, you know, you may not have been in Vietnam where the, they dropped the, the, the chemicals. You may have been 10,000 miles away. So even though you're a soldier, you don't share. If you, you know, I, I, there are ways. Settling is easy. I pray, uh, what, I, what I pray for is someone on that side of the fence, some president of some university, some athletic director who supposedly in it to make sure that all the kids are represented well, go to the NCAA and say, what are you doing? Because the only thing I've learned in this case, there are two people who will continue to get paid. The people in Indianapolis will get their pays as long as they string this damn thing out, and the lawyers will represent them. Now, on O'Bannon and any class action, as my learned friend here knows, they better win, or they're going to have a lot of hell of a lot of money. So, but they're not getting paid now. It serves the NCAA and their legislative branch to delay this as possible, to make an asinine statement as Mr. Milstein said, and it's all public, that we're going to take it to the Supreme Court. Well, they just said, basically, an uneducated man would interpret as, we're conceding. We're going to court. We're going to lose in court, but we're going to keep fighting your butts. We're going to take it. We're going to appeal. We're going to do all these things. Let's, let's figure out a way to do the right thing by the athletes. Why can't you get together, as Charles said, Basically, using the word union, Charles, in an amateur setting would, oh, that's like, you know, like saying you're going to hell. You, you can't say that. But you need a body of individuals that can deal with other individuals to make sure that everyone is equal. The only ones that don't have a say are the kids playing the game. Sonny, if, 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 the, no. if the athletes get paid, mm -hmm. what in the world is the purpose of the NCAA? The NCAA will cease to exist but it'll once be another athletes name. get paid. Then my learned Italian over here and people like him will say, we, you, can run, you can run these tournaments. They give somebody $750,000 a year for running the NCAA tournament. They That's pay right. these people in, in, in Atlanta a million dollars to run the damn Chick-fil-A. And oh, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Thank you, dear God. I forgot to tell you. You know those football players I was talking about? Do you know, Mr. Thamel, that they're on the Lend-Lease program? Because they don't give the money back to the schools like the basketball tournament does. The independent promoters make their money. They give a portion back. But these guys, the BCS guys, this guy, you know, these guys, you know, I don't know. Anyway, my, my <laughs> point is they're the only ones getting a paycheck. I, right. I think, Sonny, you're oversimplifying it a little bit, though. I mean, okay. one thing that hasn't come up here, and I certainly, on a distinguished panel with a lot of people with more advanced degrees than myself, hesitate to bring up the tax exemption of the NCAA. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a whole right. other layer here yeah. that, that just, I'm, I'm not saying it can't be done, but to say it, if, if it got to a point where people are going to get paid or money was going to get divided, I think at a certain point, the, the NCA and all its member institutions for all the billions they get, it's tax exempt. And that would, that would have to be viewed through a whole prism. And I would imagine Marty could tell us if he had to start paying taxes, his budget at UNH would. would well, 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 I think that brings up two points, and I'll let yeah. you weigh on this, Marty. Not only tax exempt, but there's, there's a whole Title IX issue yes. that, that's, that's huge at play here and um, another piece of federal law. Absolutely, and we have to su satisfy all that. And we have to satisfy state statute as far as tax exempts and goes. And, I don't think any one great institution is going to allow any athletic department to jeopardize that tax exemption for that institution. It certainly wouldn't happen at UNH. And I would contend, I wonder if it even would happen at Alabama for that matter. Charlie? Well, what makes everyone believe that they would lose their tax exempt status? I don't think that's happening. I mean, the NCAA is 
probably going to be here to stay, Sonny, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are going to fight this thing only because they think you're going to run out of time and resources. Okay? And that's what they're betting on. Uh, the point of the matter is that um, they don't want to settle and they don't want to share. You know, we, we're here at a nice uh, educational institution. Uh, you know, we, we use education to change or at least seek to change attitudes. Uh, we've been doing that, uh, at least Sonny and I, for many years with regard to those who run amateur athletics. Can you change their attitude? And the answer to that seems to be no. So that the court order and legislation must change their behavior. And so it goes down to the old attitude versus actions. Which one's first? Do I change the action? Or do I change the attitude? And quite frankly, we've had 100 years trying to change the attitude. So it is time, Sonny, that your, your firm or the lawyers that are pursuing this uh, until they can change the action. That, unfortunately, that's where we sit, because the NCAA will not sit down and talk about something that's sensible and reasonable in terms of athletes, their future, their rights, how they're compensated, when they're compensated. Those are things that they talk to everyone else about, all their subcontractors, all their professors, et cetera. But they refuse to meet and discuss things like eligibility rules, <coughs> uh, things like scholarship allocation. Those are, quite, well, I would say non-standards. And so what organizations do on behalf of the players would be able to establish, if nothing else, they didn't get a dime, would be able to establish national standards that everybody can live with, that young men and young women, young men and women, and I'm of the belief, by the way, that the NCA makes enough money that Title IX would not be a factor, that I think if it's done in the proper way, financing and or uh, bringing the women in as equal partners is certainly doable. Let, let's move on to some of the solutions. Can I just say one second there? Oh, one, one, one second. second. <laughs> one second, okay. Charles is on to something very, very big here. What I think could happen, because I, I, ladies and gentlemen, was on the other side of this. I did all those contracts with all the schools, all the coaches. I did that. That's, you know, I'm in the middle of that. I helped start that. Fine. But I know one thing for a fact. If we ever got to a point of discussing, do you really think their business partners would give a damn about paying 10% extra and throwing it in a pot for those kids. I can say this from when I was allowed to make those decisions for the companies I work for. There's not one of those men that I work for that would have said, Sonny, don't do the deal. Otherwise, if it cost us 10 more dollars, I'm saying the money would be put in the pot by the TV people. They, they need programming. The reruns of the football games are on more than you know, Big Bang Theory. Every damn time you turn something around, there's a rerun of a football game. My point here is it could be worked out. Okay. Let's, um, we'll, we'll talk more about that and some of the solutions. Uh, you know, I think everybody agrees that the abandoned case is emblematic of everything that's wrong with the NCAA and college sports today. Pete, what's the solution? Wow. Um, the, the, the solution is uh, the solution is the journalist uh, gets a tough question. <laughs> Someone well above my pay grade and intellectual grade will figure out the solution, but it's not easy. You know, they, they, this is the sort of the whole college sports model has just sort of evolved at, so it could continue to exist in the in the awkward state it's in now. And so the, the the further on you go, and the bigger the contracts, you know, the bigger the disparity goes between the people getting paid and, and the athletes who still aren't getting anything. I, I don't know if there is like a, a good solution. Obviously, I've sat around and thought about this. Right, I've talked to a lot of smart people about this over the years, and I, I don't know really how. If you start to dice it up, it gets it gets way more complicated than than we've gotten into at all. Do you pay the field hockey player at UNH? There's there's that. It, once once you start going into pay, but even uh, Alan referenced earlier, like if if there's a, a, a small victory here, and then uh, a kid who you know say the best high school recruit in the country now, Cliff Alexander. Can he get a shoe deal when he goes to Kansas? Right now he can't. They just give him some Nikes and maybe it's Adidas. Sonny would know and tell him Adidas. to go on with his way. But if you start <laughs> to do that, if you open up that door, what happens is you're opening up a door to corruption. So say he can sell his autograph. 
Well, all of a sudden, some scam is going to arise. I mean, you can see it from a million miles away. You already have a black market that's functioning right. that some autograph dealer in Tuscaloosa is going to give them $100,000 right. worth of autographs. And so it, it's, it's easy to say, oh, let him get a shoe deal. Let him profit off his likeness. But once, once you start to do that, I, I think there may be more chaos then than in the current system because when, when you open the door, it, 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 could, it would get very interesting. And, and, and Charles obviously disagrees with me. But I just think that knowing the landscape of college sports like I know it now and seeing the middlemen and the, and the operators and, and the, the runners for agents and how everything works, I just think it, become, it, it doesn't solve the, those problems uh, w when you start you know, dispersing the money among the athletes. Yeah, Charlie, I know you, you believe that unions can play a, a well, role with well, a new... It's not, not just unions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reality here is that when we had football teams, basketball teams, baseball teams, hockey teams that weren't doing well financially, they sat down and said, okay, let's work out a revenue sharing deal with the players. X percentage goes to all the players. And we share revenue among ourselves so that those teams who aren't doing well, whether it's San Antonio or whether it's Denver, then guess what? New York and LA will pick up some of your costs. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at professional football, professional basketball, baseball, you're looking at uh, 36, 120 teams, okay? And in college- of millionaires may, and billionaires. May, may, maybe they are, well, but they're generating some kind of revenue is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. They are billionaires, but they're not coming out of their pockets too much now. Sure. Because they've got very restrictive deals with those people who play. Mm -hmm. So whether or not there are 64 or 84 colleges and universities, many of which aren't doing well financially, mm -hmm. it's called revenue sharing. There's enough, you cannot tell me that college basketball, college football, and all the super conferences aren't making and generating enough money through television and licensing, group like, they can't tell me they're not making enough money. They are, it's but not But where do you cut it? Does Kentucky no. share with UNH? Of course, yeah. that's yes. what's gonna, that's yeah. exactly. Marty, Marty would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're the quintessential small market program. <laughs> but, but that's exactly, that's, right. that's yeah. exactly my that's point. Right. The Yankees share with uh, whoever but else. But the conferences system. would never fly for that. The SEC would never let Kentucky share with UNH, because well, they, they if, all. That's oh. if they had nobody to play. Okay. Oh, they find somebody no, to play. No, they I'm play. Saying, well, but it would, but no, they yeah. would not because they no. have to have a competitive balance here, and competitive balance is why there's you have barely one share. now. If you watch basketball in November, December, the right top now. 25 college teams are the same every year. The top 25 football teams are the same every year. I'm sorry, that doesn't fly. There is competitive balance because the demand is there for television. <laughs> You're paying for the rights fees. And by the way, we're oversaturating the market with those programs. No question. I mean, we add a little zest of life, if you would, when we compete, or someone similar to us compete with some of the other folks and have that opportunity to, to make the game interesting. The principles are the same. Uh, that's what I say. The principles are the same. The question is, you don't have enough people with common sense. That's the say, question. That are willing to sit down and work out those kind of arrangements. It's doable. Pete, because wait. there's a lot of money at stake. What Something. you said is true, and I, you know, and I've known him since he first started writing the cover report on Syracuse, and I watched him grow up to be who he is today. What he saw was an evolution also. He saw how a lot of these things happen. I was there at the birth rate. I'm probably the only living human being that knew all five or six of the presidents in the way. When I started working in <coughs> 1965, I, you know, Walter Byers was there. I went through all these people. I met all of them. The only thing I know is consistent. You know, how many, you know how many summit meetings they've had on cost of uh, uh, the education, the $2,000 stipend? They started that in 1991. You know when they stopped this, uh, the four-year scholarship? 1972. You know, all the, they're always having summit meetings. Then they had that, that ill-fated thing where, where Mike Krzyzewski and because there's always a group of people that are invited to the same party. Do you ever notice that? I mean, the same guys make the biggest decision. They, went, they go to Indianapolis and they have a rule against basketball. They have a rule against football. Then they meet in the, the Superdome, I believe it was, with Miles Brand and David Stern with the Unholy Alliance and they're putting up kumbaya that they're going to say basketball. I never understood how a pro team and the college president could make a deal to keep kids who aren't even under their jurisdiction, because you're talking about high school kids then, to not to do certain things. The whole point is this, Steve, uh, uh, Pete, and, and my belief is, I honestly believe there's a few honest people out there, men and women. I think, I think it can happen, because if you set in the system that this is the way it's gonna be, the kids that follow these blatant, un, unruly, 
you know, uneven rules from life. If they sign a deal, I agree with Coach here, if a kid signs the contract, then he shouldn't be able to go somewhere else and he breaks it, okay? And it's saying the same way. All these things can be in. The cost of living thing, that cost of education thing, is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of because the schools, as VJ just said, the Alabamas can give the 2,000. It's the New Haven that can, and the New, New Hampshire that can't give the 2,000. So what do we do here? If we had a pot of money, discretionary money, all, this, all the schools playing sports could give their kids the cost of tuition, or cost, whatever that thing is, and they could eat. Do you know one of the things that I'm very proud of, and I don't know any of these kids? I'm very proud of what the kids at Grambling did because it wasn't for money, was it? It was not for money. It wasn't for anything. They were treated horribly. They were lied to. They didn't eat right. It was infected in their dressing room. They could have got a disease. They stood up for that. And one man who's in this O'Bannon case, I don't know a lot of these people. You know, I know Russ and, and Bill and, some, and I know Eddie, obviously. Harry Flournoy, does that mean anything to you? He and a kid named David Latin played against Kentucky in 1966, the race game, ladies and gentlemen where a black team played a white team at Maryland's Cold Field House for the national championship. Harry was the captain of that team. I never met, I still have not met Harry Flournoy. We've become best of friends. When he elected to get into this case, see, it isn't all about the money here. It's about a principle. I'll never forget, and I'm glad I have an opportunity to share this with you group of people. Harry Flournoy said something to me that Satchel make a remark and someone of a minority will understand what he said. Sonny, I, I want to join. You know, there was a few things from Texas. It was called Texas El Paso then. They sold the movies. They sold that. It was a world-famous game. They're still selling the photos of the team you know, on the NCAA website. He said, Sonny, we've been walking in quicksand all our lives, meaning the black athlete and the black person. I, I think he extended it. But not just black. A lot of people have been walking in quicksand. Otherwise, if you don't have the help, of other people to join together to make it a, a civilized civilization, then we're, we're, we'll never get out of the quicksand. But Flournoy said to me, just the other day when, when they won the thing, I call the guys when something happens in the case, and he said, Sonny, I'm 69 years old. You know, would I like to get a $5 bill now? Yeah. But it's what's in future. They, they mean the answer. They can't keep doing this to these kids. See, there is a conscience there, and I think an athlete has one because they are a team. They are someone who fights. It's not equating it to war. I'm not going down that road, but there is a camaraderie about athletes. And I believe that it can be worked out. If the person in Indianapolis would just say, take me out of it. This guy makes the dumbest statements I've ever heard in my life. He is, I, I mean, and you can quote me on that. And I'm not demeaning him. They're dumb statements. He actually said, uh, you know, about Johnny Menzel, well, I didn't know we are selling his autograph. How the hell didn't somebody go and tell him, you've been selling their autographs? How did Jay Billis, a reporter, come up with one of the best things that happened in this case was they sell all these kids' stuff on their billboard, on their website. I, excuse me. But my, my point I'm making, I believe something positive can happen. The NCAA, not under the regime of the, these people who are running it in a different form. There has to be structure. There has to be. It can work. There's got to be a discretionary fund. There's got to be things that can do for these athletes that can make them whole. Well, what you said earlier, Sonny, about who controls college sports, it's really five commissioners yeah. right now. Yeah. And they control college sports because they control the money. Yes. It's, pretty, it's pretty simple. And what they've done, like why we never had a college football playoff until next year now, is because all those, it was six and now it's five, those commissioners were just holding on to their piece yes. of the cookie and they were holding on to their money. And now what Charles says makes perfect sense in theory. Okay, let's share. But these people who have white-knuckled onto their piece of the cookie and white-knuckled onto their money, all of a sudden now aren't going to give up their money mm -hmm. so Marty can get a nicer practice facility at UNH and maybe they can compete. Um, it's just, it, 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 it makes sense in theory, but in practice, everything has evolved. So, you know, 98% of the money is controlled by the 60 schools that are mm -hmm. that are at the that top five tier level now in the conferences. And I just don't, I mean, those guys are too smart to give the money up. I really think it comes down that, to that. That's, that's why uh, a court order 
yeah. will be helpful. Yeah. That's, that's, why <laughs> that's what it will take. <laughs> well, of course. No, 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 no. We're all, we're all adults here. We yeah. know what the sure. game is. Yeah. You give up what you have to give up. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. at some point here, we may get to the point where they have to give it up. Mm -hmm. And if it's the Supreme Court, it's the Supreme Court. Yeah. But the bottom line here is there can be resolved and because the principles aren't so far off. And everything yeah, we're talking about here, how how much competitive balance there is, who's hoarding the money, that's key for antitrust analysis, right? Where a court would say, this isn't competitive at all. In fact, you could argue the NFL, where players are paid, is much more competitive. Way more. Way uh, more, right? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a crucial, yeah. I think, I think you mentioned the board. This is a, <laughs> this is a religious <laughs> quest to, to get the NCA to give up uh, the idea that you can pay athletes, that you can't pay athletes, would be like getting the Catholic Church to give up the Bingo. idea of immaculate <laughs> conception. <laughs> or, or to give uh, the Jewish religion to give up the fact that, uh, that God gave Moses a Torah from, from the mount. It, it, they will die before they settle this case. <laughs> And and when when the case is over, if, if it's, if it's over in favor of O'Bannon, and student and, and athletes who are at universities get paid, the NCAA will cease to exist. I want to I want to get to some questions soon, but before we do that, I want to give everybody an opportunity to give a brief closing brief, Sonny. Um, <laughs> We'll go, we'll go to you last. Um, let, let's start with Pete. I just said a lot. I don't. I don't have. A, I don't have a ton more to uh, to add other than it's a it's a fascinating time in, uh, in in college sports, and I'm I don't have the investment that some of the gentlemen uh, up here have in the uh, in the proceedings of the case, but I, I'm fascinated to see how it unfolds. Um, <clears throat> I'm hopeful that um, cooler heads will prevail at some point. Um, it's going to take a lot more time. Uh, it may get to the Supreme Court, may have to go there. Uh, but you know, um, I had a, a, a very uh, good experience back in the middle 90s. And I was um, in South Africa with Nelson Mandela. And um, he said a very funny thing to me at that time. Uh, at the time, uh, we were negotiating a new contract with, uh, with the NBA. And we had trouble getting a deal. And sitting there talking to Nelson, um, he finally said, look, he says, you know, no matter, how, no matter how committed you are to your position, at some point in the negotiation, your individual agenda, your individual agenda has to be separated from the good of the whole. And, and at that point, I said and to David, we both sat and said, well, 27 years in jail, and he could come up with that. I think we could come up with a collective bargaining agreement. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really believe it's going to take more time, mm -hmm. and I think we may get to the Supreme Court. But I also believe that they're going to get the class uh, status, and that's going to continue to put more pressure. Dealing with something like an institution like the NCAA, that's why I also suggested because of that institution that you do need professionals uh, and I do believe the coalition of sports unions, for example, could be very helpful, uh, Sonny, uh, with regard to applying that kind of pressure. So, you know, Alan mentioned he doesn't believe it's going to settle, but he also said that he compared the NCAA to the Soviet Union. Well, how did the Soviet Union fall? It was from within. And I think there's a chance we could see conference commissioners and college presidents say, I don't want to take a chance with this case. This is way too threatening. This could change things in such a radical way that we can't afford the consequences. I believe there will be an effort to settle prior to a trial, and I think it ultimately will settle. The second thing I want to say is, I hope whatever is a settlement, or victory, or loss, that if college athletes are gonna be compensated, part of it includes better health care, better disability payments, including for mental health issues, and some type of deferred compensation where they don't get everything instantly. I think a system like that is healthy for everyone involved. And you know, Charles, you, you know from NBA players and, and other players associations where players lose money quickly once their playing career is over. Well, we can do something about it. We can stagger payments. We've done that in our legal system. We've done that through public policy. I hope we learn from that. 
It's a good segue to what I wanted to say, Michael. I, I think my three colleagues adequately stated what I wanted to say as well. I first of all think that those of us that are in charge of our institution's athletic programs and the student athletes need to align ourselves in a better way. That's, that's for sure. The fact of the matter is the Division I ADs are attempting to do that right now. I don't want to say it has to result in a dissolution of the NCAA, but it's really a knowledge. Of, the way I feel is if we all the Division I programs are on a train hurtling down the tracks at about 70 miles an hour, no one's going to jump off that train. There are going to have to be checks along the way to slow the train down, and then that's going to show kinks in the armor, and some people will have the courage to step out and take control of their own destiny. I feel as though a school like UNH, which basically represents a majority of Division I, doesn't really have a place at the table right now. If we can garner a place at the table, I think that things will effectively change. Clearly, the five commissioners of the five power conferences control the destiny of places like ours. Somehow, they have to divest that power. I really like the profit sharing. The other thing that has to happen is that the profit sharing has to be inclusive of the BCS bowl games because there is an enormous sum of money tied up in those bowl games outside of the NCAA, which means it's outside of the subsidy of Division I institutions like mine. So you have to sum up the basketball tournament, divestment of the bowl games, bring everybody to the table. I really do believe in a, in a student athlete union. I would test my athletic department and my programs against any student athlete union representative and feel as though we would pass muster. And I believe that many athletic departments would. But clearly, student athletes deserve and need a place at the table. Let's go to you, Alan. We'll come back to you, Sonny. We'll give you the last word. I'd say the line that is drawn, the curse that is cast, the first one now will later be last. The times, they are changing. You got Mr. Alex. Bob Dylan right there in front well of you. Well said. <laughs> Alex. Sure. I teach entertainment law, and I got to come at this discussion tonight from an entertainment kind of angle and think about athletes as entertainers. Um, but what I think a, a lot of my fellow panelists, uh, Sonny and Mike and others, have driven home, and what the concussion litigation really brought to the fore is that this is a different role, right? College athletes at this level are doing something that has almost as much in common with joining the Army as it does with being a television actor, right? So it's clear, however um, the details and the resolution goes down, it's clear that we need to do more to protect these athletes. Um, and I also, just as the only woman on the panel, I'm going to circle back to the Title IX issue. I think people are proposing some great solutions, but a lot of them are going to butt up against or run afoul of Title IX. The spirit there, the spirit behind Title IX is that high school and college athletics, um, that, that women deserve to be treated equally, that female athletes and female teams deserve the same funding that the male teams have historically gotten. So once we start talking about revenue sharing and we start talking about, you know, kind of a competitive whoever brings in the most and gets the most attention should get the most in return. We really bump up against that, and I do think that's problematic. Okay, Sonny, you got the last word. I, I think the Title IX can be solved, young lady. First of all, they don't have football, so they don't have the expenses of a total athletic program. 90% of the money spent is making the big stadiums and the, all these things that they do, the public housing for the football team. So I think, I think that answer could be. What I would like to say, and no way am I equating this to anything as great as what all the great advocates of change in their lives have done. But I watched one thing happen with this case. Eddie O'Bannon stepped up, and then others stepped up. When I see Bill Russell and Oscar Robertson and Harry Florino and all the others, and I see young kids who are playing college football today put their name to the list, I think that we're in good hands if we allow these sports to take care of these athletes. If Russ can say it, if Oscar can say it, two of the greatest players, and they've done wonderful things in their lives. Hell, Oscar fought for free agency and in the NBA. These guys have gone through this. They don't need $5. As Harry said, he doesn't need $5. This can work. The only impediment is, and I'm agreeing with Alan on one point, the people in Indianapolis. They're the only ones that have a lot to lose. They have their stature and their pay thing. Why Mark Emmert or anybody who's the president of the NCAA would get paid $2 million a year is beyond me because I don't know what his job is. I have no idea what that guy's job is. And I'm not, I'm not being negative. I'm not throwing stones. I don't know what. The, no, I'm not. 
I don't know what the heck he does. He just, he, I don't know what he does. He, this thing in Miami, all these things. Pete, Pete Thamel should have gotten an award about six or seven years ago on the educational system in these prep schools. That was one of the best writings and best things that happened. Him, a guy named George Dorman, wrote things on academics. George went right to the heart of the University of Minnesota, and Pete went right to the system that funded all the universities academically. What you don't know, because you're so immune from it, because you're, you're dean and you got, got, you got, got academic integrity. The courses that some of these kids take in high school or prep school to get to these schools are, I'm saying it, I'm the advocate for these kids. I think they're all disadvantaged, they all need help, but I know that they didn't get educated and they certainly didn't get educated in the classes we got here. What he did, nothing happened. Some of those schools are still in existence. It was unbelievable. You look at it and you say, well, it's changed. To, Alan, to Alan's credit here, there's never been change. They just keep going on and on. But I think O'Bannon, this never would have happened five years ago in the University of New Hampshire, where the hockey guy is the most important guy athletically on campus. That doesn't happen anywhere else. This could not have happened. But you know what? It did happen because the hockey guy and his athletes are part of the system. And you guys play under different rules. You go to school, you graduate, you become somebody, you do something. And that's a priority here. Michael gave me a thing that the, the, the kids in this, this school that you're in here, you, you, you're, you're, you're fifth in something. You're, you're very well <laughs> in <laughs> something. Fifth in no, no, third in externships in the Northeast. Well, that's, because Ellen, right? And we have. <laughs> that's wonderful. I know all the stats. Right? But that, that's my point. See, <laughs> isn't that what it's about? The faculty. Isn't, yeah, isn't that what it's about? But when you talk about intellectual properties that the young lady's been eloquating over here on, you know, how in the world can we say that that wasn't Eddie O'Bannon? That's, that's sinful to pretend that. But until Eddie filed suit, they've been saying it. So I hope that intelligent people get together, and non-intelligent people, because they have good ideas also, <laughs> okay? And they say, we can fix this. We, I really believe it can be fixed. I believe a deal can be made. I do. I believe a deal. And I also believe if a deal isn't made, then Mr. Grant will come back, and I think there's going to be a union. I think the kids will rebuild. I think the team that didn't go out in the court in the 90s and the 80s, I think we'll have that. And I, you know what? I'd, glad, I'd gladly give my last blood, and I'm not being a martyr here. I'll tell you what. If this case doesn't get heard, at least get heard. That's all I'm, I ever asked for. Then I think these kids will rebel. And I don't think they'll have a game on New Year's Day. I mean that. These kids are getting stronger, and they know, the, they know the, what's happening out there. Thank you, Sonny. Um, I want to open it up to you. You guys have been a great audience. Um, uh, for any questions, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, we can take some. Yes. Mike, you want to take that? Yeah, it's a harder argument. I mean, it sounds like it's a monopoly, right? It controls college sports. But case law would suggest that the NCAA is fairly insulated under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So that's really a Section 2 argument. The Section 1 would be the cartel, the NCAA, universities, conferences joining hands. Lawyers, antitrust lawyers tend to focus more on that as a better avenue for redress. I, for one, would never want to see that happen. I think that would be the ruination of intercollegiate sport as we know knows it, and particularly damaging to Title IX and the efficacy of women athletes. But, but even at UNH, we work really hard to take away any entitlement, if you would, from any of our 
pro high profile athletes, generally speaking, the, the hockey players. I mean, they, we try to segue them into alignment with not only with our other student athletes, but the, with the student body at large. And I think we have to maintain that type of philosophy across all institutions. Thank you. Mr. Sanders. The only time that I've ever seen in the last 10 years Congress get involved, in, and it's a very good question, um, is when, uh, take for example Utah football, when they were no, not part of the BCS, Orrin Hatch from Utah, you know, just would throw fire in the air for attention that Utah needed to get involved. And now Utah's in the Pac-12, and Orrin Hatch doesn't talk about college sports anymore. It's been on an <laughs> as-need <laughs> basis, if you will. And so, if, say you're a senator from Alabama and there's something that would threaten the future of Alabama football or threaten Alabama's tax-exempt status. Like, because such, there's so many state in, large state institutions that are, that are tied into the NCAA, and it's basically, you take the BCS conferences, I would say 85% of them are probably big public schools, you know, that are your, that are your money makers. There's no incentive for Congress to do anything to change, because a majority of the public, I think, and Sonny would certainly disagree with me on this, just wants to watch March Madness, cheer for State U on Saturday, and they don't really care about the rest of it. And if something were to percolate up to change that, there wouldn't be a whole lot of incentive for congressmen to do that because it would it would directly impact their constituencies. So that's my very nickel, non-legal opinion. Charlie, you testified before Congress. Um, the one thing that we haven't talked about that could get there is the concussion issue. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, you see the concussions rise to the level that the NFL has had, I think that may change some uh, opinions. Sir. It, it's already at that level. It is already at that level. Go ahead, from, from, well, the, the, numbers, the, 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 the numbers are already there. Let him go. Let him go. And, and we sponsor the concussion legislation. We want to bring it down not only to the college level, but to the high school, at the high school level and the grammar school level. I think that's, a, that's an excellent there's a situation that, that could affect could affect the child and have dramatic effects right across right. the board. And, and that it's something like that which I think could lead to change. And I think the tax situation is also something that legislators look at. There's a lot of tax exempt money. And that money grows and grows and grows. And one of these days that tax exempt money could be looked at very, very carefully. Endowment is going to be looked at very, very Very critical issue that's going to be looked at very carefully as we move forward. Okay. More questions? Yes. This is from Charles. How about a good old fashioned player strike? Well, I think well, absent, absent, like absent, yeah. absent uh, Grambling, what they experienced a week ago, um, and I, would I like to see one day uh, in the season that everybody take off? Yes. I think it would only take one day. It may be Friday, the day of uh, all the college games that people just don't play one day. Um, I just don't think that's realistic, particularly within the super conferences. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know that that would happen. I, I think it will happen, Charles. I think Ramoki Huma, you know, a man who's been involved in this fight as equally as I have on a different level and different causes, he's more. He's more humane in what he's looking for. He's looking for that scholarship. He's looking for, you know, whatever. But when the kids were the, you know, athletes united, I think I think there's a movement there, and I believe that if things don't go where the kids get a, a chance to speak, I think we're going to have. I, I think it can happen. I, I do, and I think it'll be at a very appropriate time. And it won't be some nonsensical game. I can remember in my mind. You know, in the 80s and 90s, I'm not going to, and Pete already figured this out, I know, 25 years ago, there were schools in a school that was ready to do it if they ever reached the championship game. That, that was in, trust me, that was there. What basically happened is in basketball, the one in, not, the, the kids were able to go directly from high school to pro. So that whole thing 
left because the people who would lead the insertion would be the greatest players and the greatest teams. You need a team to get to the Final Four or to get to the, one of these bowl games to be significantly it. When the public can't see the game, they're all going to be aggravated. So when these kids left, when Kobe and Tracy and Kevin and you know, LeBron and all those kids left, there was never a single team or teams that the public gravitated to individually. You all talk about Michael Jordan, but you forgot that you know, he had four other great players on that team at North Carolina. Patrick Ewing, but he had other great players. All those years before the, the inequities of college athletes, it was all simmering. So the team in the 80s, right before that happened, was close to doing it. Because I am involved, I've watched all these kids. I, I, I don't know the kids who joined the current athletes, but I think that if O'Bannon doesn't get resolved in a, in a fair and equitable way that you can justify to the athlete plan, I think one of these days they're going to throw the ball up or kick it off, and it's going to be like Snoopy the dog. They're going to take the ball away. <laughs> they're going to do it. They're, they're going to take the ball away. Let me say one thing about the concussion litigation, because I know that's a, that's a hot topic. And, you know, we're, we're here, we're trying to find solutions. There is no solution to the concussion issue. There is none. If football players tackle each other and block each other, there are going to be concussions. The only solution to the concussion issue is to end football, which isn't going to happen. You know, so it, it's easy to say, well, you know, let's have a hearing and let's let's just, let's uh, let's try to come up with solutions. No, no, I don't think we're talking about the solution to concussions. We're talking about would it get to the level that Congress would scrutinize all the rules and regulations no, governing that. behavior. And that's really what we're interested in. We're, I don't think you're going to find that solution. What we are trying to do is to bring it up to change. The same thing happened with steroids. If you recall, it took how long before the government said steroids is a problem because our youth are being effective in a negative way. And it got their attention. That's all we're trying to do. I don't think we can, we can come up with a medical a solution for the concussions. That's not the issue. But I think it will grab enough attention that Congress could pay attention. And then once you do that, once you put the microscope on it, there are a lot of other things that come out. The, the word amateur, our Italian friends will tell us, means lover. <laughs> That's what it does mean. That's what it means. So... I thought you were going to say morte. <laughs> morte. So, they, so that's why I don't, th I don't think we're going to have a strike. I think the, 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 the students who are playing these sports love to play the yes. sports. Athletes love to play the sports. And they, and they can, you know, as the pros will tell you, you, know, you, can love, you can love to play the sports and still get some money. Yes. It doesn't, doesn't take away the love. I mean, Alan, to your point, as I started out with tonight, within one team, even a basketball team with five individuals on the floor, three of those individuals may not align themselves with the one star because they love the sport and they want to play even though that one star is completely taken advantage of and undervalued. 